Welcome to ACF United Focus on Pastry, Best Practices, and Future Trends for Bakers. Thank you, chefs, for joining us from all across the country today for this important discussion. American Culinary Federation represents the largest association of professional chefs in North America, including you, our pastry chefs and bakers. We know that our food service industry is facing an unprecedented crisis. We've all been impacted by COVID-19 in many ways, and there will be challenges ahead. Typically, global pastry and cake retail sales are over $200 billion annually. Today, we'll discuss how leaving your bake shops, uh, restaurants, clubs, classrooms, uh, differs in many ways from traditional culinary roles as pastry chefs. Our distinguished panelists will be sharing best practices and innovative baking solutions, as well as what the future holds for the pastry industry. And now I'd like to welcome my special guest, Kiwi Hermans, Culinary Program Specialist from ACF Certification. Thanks, Kiwi. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, before we begin, as a note, we've received many questions via email in advance, and we will also be taking questions from you, the viewers, as we are able. Please use the chat function to collaborate and the Q&A function to pose questions to our ACF moderators. Let's meet our speakers, a truly amazing panel of professionals, and we are so honored to have you all join us today. They all have incredible resumes, and so we apologize that we had to shorten them all for the sake of time so that we can get to as many of your questions as possible. First up is chef and um, author Andy Shelbana, who is an ACF certified executive pastry chef who earned his degree in culinary arts from Joliet Junior College before enrolling at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park to study baking and pastry. Chef Andy has spent the last 14 years teaching baking at Joliet Junior College in Illinois, during which time he was named ACF Pastry Chef of the Year in 2008. Chef has also competed on Food Network, winning the Spring Break Baking Championship, and was runner-up on Best Baker in America. Most recently, Chef Andy was the pastry chef for ACF Culinary Team USA, representing the United States in the Culinary World Cup in Luxembourg in the fall of 2019, where the team earned two silver medals. Currently, Chef Shelbana is coach of Pastry Team USA, who will be competing in the Coup de Mon in Lyon in January of 2021. Next up is our winner of Iron Chef Thailand Pastry Edition, James Beard nominated author, Jason Licker, who's pushing pastry to another level. Jason left the United States for a life and series of professional adventure in Asia, helming executive pastry chef positions at the Westin Bund in Shanghai, the Manishan Macau Hotel and Resort, the JW Marriott Hong Kong, and was the former corporate pastry chef of C'est La Vie restaurants. His first cookbook, Liquorland, Asian Ascented Desserts by Jason Liquor, which was the only self-published cookbook nominated for a James Beard Award in 2017. Jason is working on his second self-published book, Baking with Liquor, fusing his love for home baking with his passion for Asian ingredients. Welcome, Chef. Next up, we have Chef Richard Coppage Jr., who has been a professor of baking and pastry arts at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, since 1992. Chef Coppage instructs courses on advanced baking principles to students pursuing their bachelor's and associate's degree from the CIA. During his tenure at the college, he has taught various bread and baking courses. Chef Coppage is a certified master baker and the author of the books Gluten-Free Baking with the CIA and author of Baking for Special Diets. Welcome. Next up, we have Chef Natasha Capper, who is an ACF certified executive pastry chef. She holds a degree in food service management from Johnson & Wales University. Her career has included positions with Grove Park Inn, Renaissance Hotels, and the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company. She is currently the executive pastry chef at Piedmont Driving Club in Atlanta, Georgia. She is an avid competitor who has competed in a wide array of pastry competitions, including two national pastry team championships, winning Best Bread Showpiece at the 2006 Bread and Pastry Team Championship, Best Sugar Showpiece at Pastry Live, and the 2007 ACF Southeastern Pastry Chef of the Year, among a variety of other accolades and awards. Thank you for being here. 
Next up, we have Chef Jeremy Fogg, who is currently the pastry chef for Emerald's Restaurants, in which he oversees the pastry programs for Emerald's New Orleans, NOLA Restaurant, and Emerald's Coastal Italian. He is also a brand ambassador for Calibo Chocolate. He has received awards and accolades such as being featured on Zagat's 30 Under 30 list for New Orleans in 2016 and being named one of New Orleans Magazine's People to Watch in 2018. He has also appeared on the Food Network as a contestant on multiple baking shows, having won Beat Bobby Flay and Chop Sweets. Thank you for being here, Chef. Next up, we have Chef Michael Zabrowski, who is a lecturing instructor for the School of Baking and Pastry Arts at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Chef specializes in all aspects of managing pastry kitchens, including customized menu development, food and labor cost control, team building, mentoring, and production. Additionally, he is the co-author of the Pastry Chef's Little Black Book, Volumes 1 and 2, and a proud member of the American Culinary Federation. Thank you so much for being here. And last but certainly not least, we have Chef Jeffrey Blount, who is a CEPC, who teaches baking and pastry arts at International Culinary Institute of Myrtle Beach. Chef Blount's training includes an associate's degree in culinary arts from CPCC, bachelor's degree from Strayer University, and a master's from Western Carolina University in entrepreneurship. Chef was named ACF Chef Educator of the Year in 2012, and he has earned numerous awards, including Best Pastry Shop Twice, recognized as one of the top 10 Charlotte chefs, and his desserts have been featured at multiple James Beard dinners. His professional career includes roles in top hotels, pastry shops, and clubs throughout the southeastern United States. Wow, that is incredible. Now I'll pass it back to Jackie Pressinger, ACF Director of Strategic Partnerships. All right, thank you so much, Kiwi. Uh, it's quite an uh, impressive group of professionals. Again, thanks all for being here. Uh, many of you uh, may not know that I also graduated from the Baking and Pastry degree program at the Culinary Institute of America back in the 90s and worked my uh, entire career in pastry before joining the team at the ACF National Office. So today is uh, super exciting and, and such an honor uh, to be here to talk about this topic. So I thought first we might just do um, a little bit of an icebreaker question. Uh, before we get into um, some of the questions from our viewing audience and those that were emailed in advance. And so I'd like to go around um, and uh, Chef um, Zabrowski, I'm going to start with you. If you could um, just let us know briefly what skills um, that you think are most desirable in a pastry chef or, or what would make a pastry chef successful. Well, it's a great question. Now, if we're talking on the level of chef as opposed to, you know, cook, you know, I, I think uh, some of the desirable traits would certainly be um, having a well-rounded knowledge, um, you know, being, being flexible, as, as uh, you know, my fellow panelists can attest to, you know, there's all kinds of curveballs and things that pop up, and we have to be able to pivot and, uh, you know, be able to make it happen. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, Chef Capper, your thoughts? Um, certainly, I think one of the most important things I think is to constantly hone your craft. We're craftspeople after all. So, I mean, it's all fine and well if you can do a sugar show piece, but as a pastry chef, my cookie is probably a lot more important to my customer than that show piece is. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Chef Fogg, your thoughts? Um, I would say patience, uh, because a lot of what we do is an instant gratification. And just like Chef Capper just said, you have to really hone your craft and that takes time to do. Like you're going to have failures. I know I've had plenty of them, but that's how we learn and we grow. And uh, patience, it really is, you know, taking the time to realize, okay, you may not get it right the first time or even like the third, fourth and fifth times, but eventually you will as long as you keep your focus and keep working on, you know, mastering that skill. Excellent, thank you. And Chef Coppedge, your thoughts? Well, I would say first is just to remember to uh, respect the basics and functionality of every ingredient and also have a fair amount of humility, you know, because you will make mistakes and you're gonna work on honing your craft as our panelists have already said. And just, yeah, remember your basics because you have to start with, you know, 
understand how to make a cookie before you can make this showpiece. Excellent, thank you. And Chef Licker. Oh, Chef Licker's on mute. Mute, All right. there we go. Yes. <laughs> oh, he's back on mute. All right. Chef, well, um, there you go. There we go. Um, he's having some technical difficulties over here, Jackie. Um, <laughs> you hear the sirens, they're about to arrest me. Um, I think with the upcoming, in the day and age that we're in now, it's about empowering yourself and not being afraid because the, the direction that I see that this world is going in, a lot of people now that we're gonna have lack of communication and exposure to human beings are gonna start regressing and people need to empower themselves and not be afraid. And you need to focus and conquer what you wanna do in your career. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and Chef Blunt. Um, one of the biggest things that I tell my students is um, having passion. Um, just pure, just you, you got to love this. Um, you need to have an honest love for the craft itself. And I know it doesn't seem like a skill, but it's probably one of the most important things. I think the other panelists can agree. If, if, if you don't have a passion and love for this, you're everything else is for nothing, I think. Uh, so just to have a passion and love for pastry and the skills as, as a whole. Great, great. Um, and uh, Chef Shabana. Yes. Uh, Jeff, the passion, I agree 100% with you. The passion is so important. Uh, the thing that I always tell my students is when you get out there, you just need to be able to listen. Listen and take it all in, right? Because they don't, they don't need someone to come in there that's going to take over their kitchen. They need somebody who's going to start working and, and do what needs to be done. There'll be plenty of opportunities later for you to, to kind of branch out and do more of your own things. But at the beginning, you need to be a good listener, be a sponge and absorb as much as you can, and just bust your butt when you're in there. I, I, one of my favorite examples for my students is garbage cans, right? We've all seen bags falling in garbage cans. And like, if, if I see a student throw something in the garbage can, the bag's down there, it kind of upsets me. If I see the student that goes and pulls that can and puts it ba the bag back up, that's the one that I'm gonna ask to help me out with special projects. Right, excellent. Um, well, thank you all. Um, now we're gonna get into um, a little bit of um, a, a, a tough subject, um, which is um, the COVID-19 crisis. So I was wondering, Chef Pepper, I'm gonna come to you first, and then of course anyone else um, can pipe in and, um, and add to it. But um, I'm wondering what you might be able to share of what you might have done um, in, your, in your club or, or what you might have heard of other pastry chefs doing in order to maintain revenue during these restrictive times. Certainly, thank you, Jackie. Um, so the, one of the first things we did as a, as a club was uh, create a food to go program that included pro, uh, high end proteins and things like that. Uh, the membership was it was set up through the website. The membership was able to order. And then um, if they were within a certain mile radius of the club, um, somebody would actually deliver it to them the following afternoon. Uh, so that was definitely very popular. Um, now we're kind of moving into the next phase. Um, one of our restaurants will be opening next week. Um, you know, it'll be interested to see, you know, how the membership, whether or not we're getting, you know, it's going to be slow or if, you know, they're going to have missed it and, you know, we get quite a lot of people. We'll see what happens. I mean, we've taken measures. Everything has been spaced apart in the kitchen. All of the work areas are now uh, at least six feet apart. Uh, masks and gloves are required at all times. Um, we've gone to some extensive sanitation, uh, you know, and cleaning programs. Uh, I mean, a lot of it is common sense. A lot of it is stuff that was all, you know, that's straight up surf safe, but th just an enhanced system and maybe, a, I mean, a serious re-energizing of that. Um, and we will see where we go from there. Uh, we don't really have any banquet revenue, so to speak. All of the banquets have been pushed um, or either canceled. So we still don't even know really what is considered the acceptable number of people for a social gathering. So, you know, that's, that's going to make a difference. So we really, even the stuff that's coming up in the future, we don't really know where those guarantees are going to land. Um, so it'll, it's, a, it's a learning curve. It's definitely interesting. <laughs> yes, a a absolutely. Um, and um, I'm going to add this to the question, but then also open it up to, to the group as well. Um, we received a question in advance um, that due to the concerns um, around COVID and social distancing, as you mentioned, 
Um, you know, that affects a lot of pastry service, whether that's buffets or action stations or um, even bread service um, on the tables. Um, and so, uh, you know, brunch and, and um, dessert service is going to uh, certainly change for a lot of establishments. Would any of the chef panelists like to um, touch upon any of these changes moving forward? I mean, I'd be glad to, but... <laughs> <laughs> a little shy. Um, I'll go first. Sure. Um, Who's at the club? Go ahead. Please, please. Who? Uh, sure, Chef Yes, please. Yes, yes, Chef. Okay. Chef um, so the restaurants are all still closed as of right now, um, but in the talks that we've been having about when we do reopen, we have already decided nothing communal, um, so no bread service. Uh, so that's kind of a bummer because that's one of my favorite parts of what we do at our restaurant. Um, and I know that masks and gloves, of course, will be required. Uh, our only service at Emeralds is table service. We don't do buffets unless it's for private events like buyouts. Uh, which, of course, those probably won't be happening in the very near future at all. Um, so I think once we can reopen our regular service, as far as doing the plating, will pretty much remain the same. Uh, but I do know that that bread service is a big one and communal things like I think even something as small as like salt and pepper shakers on the table, like anything that would kind of require or inspire multiple people to be handling the same things is going to be just completely unavailable. Sure. Um, thank you for Jackie, that. Can um, I add? Yes, please. Sorry, Matt. Ma so um, talking about the bread service, so what we've gone to is the um, service step will pass, offer the bread, and then place mm -hmm. it on their plate. Um, you know, that way only one individual is handling that serving utensil. Uh, one of the big things that we will be dealing with coming up very soon is going to be wedding cakes. Um, so all of the wedding cakes, I've already reached out to anybody who, who I've spoken to, and we're going to be doing faux cakes, um, and, you know, we'll do the do cake plated in the back that can then be, uh, can then be served, because all of our events are going to be uh, table service for now. We, the only sort of buffet setup that we have that's probably going to be at the golf course, and everything on those buffets will be individually packaged, so... Um, that's really, we're probably going to live with that for a long time. Wow, that's a great, great advice. I hadn't um, really thought about the, the wedding cake, so that's, that's excellent. Um, you know, and in this time when um, it's uncertain, um, uh, chefs going back to work and some of these other challenges in, in um, baking, I know some chefs and maybe some who are even viewing are now uh, potentially considering whether or not they want to keep their pastry production or their bread production in-house. Um, uh, I, I'd love to hear um, any of the chef's thoughts on the benefits of having a uh, pastry chef and baker uh, on, on property, um, or, or if you don't agree. Uh, chef Zabrowski, I saw you take yourself off mute, so I'm hoping that means uh, that, that you'd like to chime in. Well, uh, for me, I've been uh, paying attention to what's going on out there in the country, in the world, and getting a sense of how chefs are evolving, where their heads are at. Um, and it, quite frankly, I don't think a lot of us know the, the answer. And uh, it, it kind of lends itself more towards, uh, you know, that uncertainty. Um, but like some of the other panelists had shared, they, those are um, good initiatives and hopefully that works. Uh, you know, where I, where I live in New York, it's, um, it's, it's more challenging than, uh, you know, maybe some other parts of the country right now. And we'll see how it goes. Uh, but, you know, one of the thing, one of the challenges that we all have is, is this concept of, of social distancing. And, you know, as a lot of us know, kitchens don't really make money, right? It's a dining room, it's seats, you know, that, that make money. So kitchens are generally on the smaller side, especially pastry kitchens, you know, in a restaurant setting where you know, we're working on top of each other. And so you're asking about, you know, should we outsource? That could be uh, a way to go for, for some people. Uh, it wouldn't be my, my preference. Um, I'm certainly an advocate for having a pastry apartment in, in restaurants. Um, but I can't say that that would be uh, bad for, for some people. You know, I, we'll see how it unfolds. Excellent. Um, any other chefs? Yeah, I, I would yeah. say that I think uh, your clientele would feel better knowing that it was produced by one person or a really small department 
there on site, meaning less contact and, and less issues with critical control points. It's being handled right, right there at, at the shop. So there is something positive about what Chef Sabrowski is saying. You know, I mean, obviously we all want to say, let's let's keep everything in house, let's keep jobs. But um, I think the other part of that is it, it's important to do that because the control points are are limited. You're not bringing it from a facility somewhere else and then a truck and then a driver and then the back of a truck and so on and so forth. I mean, it's it's made there in the mixer and it's done. So you're cutting out some of those touch points. Sure. Um, and I think there was another chef who might have wanted to touch upon either COVID or um, production. Uh, yes, uh, Chef Shalvana. And, and to build on what Jeff said, I mean, he, he's getting it. And I think a lot of times when, when people are you know, we're dealing with this at the college, right? Because we've been closed down and we're getting ready to open for fall. But as people start thinking ahead, like, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Nobody thinks about all the other things that, that could possibly go wrong. They go, oh, it's simple. We'll just buy it from someone else because now I, I don't have room for my pastry chef. I don't have that, right? We can hear all these excuses all day long. And we all know when, when you know, the economy tanks and businesses are slow, they look at us and go, you guys cost us money. And we know we make money because we can practically print money. Most of what we make has air in it. Come on, guys. We're not, we're not selling things that are expensive. Um, but, but what Jeff said too, and, and that's where I was going to go with it before he brought it up, right? You're bringing product from somewhere else. So what about all these factories that are large wholesale bakeries, right? Somebody goes in there and gets COVID. Now they're shut down for two weeks, right? So now, great. I just fired my pastry chef because I don't need him. And the company that was supplying me is now shut down for at least two weeks until they, they have an opportunity to get everybody, kind of get everything worked out over the 14 days and start back up on production. I mean, it's, there's a, there's, it's some things it feels like we're just, just jumping to do things and, and not really thinking them all the way through. And, and people are like, oh, that's what we're gonna do. And that's it, it's fine, great, let's go. And, and there's just a lot more to think about as we, as we move forward through this. Absolutely, thank you. Um, any, any other thoughts? Um, well, thank you, that's certainly great information. Um, and so thinking into um, when, when everyone is back uh, rocking and rolling in their bakeries or in their um, food service outlets, um, I'd love to move on to, to thinking about maybe even part of the creative process. So um, I'd love to hear what inspires you to um, create some of your different menu items um, or offerings and um, you know how it is that you construct your um, pastry menus and if it's something that um, that you change daily or weekly or, um, or what that might look like. Um, so I'm uh, wondering if we might be able to um, start off with um, Chef um, Coppage. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I focus a lot with my students on, you know, understanding allergy scenarios. So I think, you know, from that point of view, if I get a person to realize what the customer needs through communication and then they look at their basic baking uh, prowess you can make something because you know it's a treat you know we, we all eat dessert because not just because we're hungry but because we might be stressed out in times like right now and we feel like we justify ourselves for that treat so it's always a good thing to have something that anyone can eat and you know i think if you take the uh, premise of some of the allergen strategies in the COVID-19 scenario. You can make something, you just have to maybe think it through a little more extremely thorough to, uh, to assure yourself and the customer that you're making it so they can enjoy it without any worry. Absolutely, and um, I'll just stick with you for just a moment, if you don't mind. Um, what what are some of, and I know we have limited time, but um, some of the uh, key instructions that you do speak to your students about when it comes to allergies? Um, are there um, uh, any recommendations you have for the chefs who are watching? Well, I mean, a lot of it, if you are going to post it on your menu, you have to be more than 100% assured that you're doing it right. Sometimes you may not get the allergen, understanding of that allergen until it's uh, communicated by the guest. And you, know, you, can't, you can't fake it. You have to do it the right way. So you have to make sure you investigate the source of your ingredients. That would take gluten free, for example, which is very still a hot topic. But you know, you know, there's no faking it. You have to be very thorough. And I think I also tell my students, 
you have to tell the customer that you can't uh, oblige, at least you're being honest, because you don't want to do it halfway because you don't know how severe of a reaction that customer may, may have to whatever potential allergy might be remaining in the product. It's almost like, you know, like today's day and age with the PPE and how you know, all the uh, first responders and medical workers have to be, they have to be thorough because you can't fake it. Thank you very much. Um, and when we're thinking about, um, again, the, the menus, the writing menus, um, or even some things that you might have put on a menu that you think would have been a huge success and may have fallen short um, when it came to sales, um, uh, I was wondering if um, any of the other chefs might want to share their thoughts. Sure. So anyway, oops, I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, uh, being in a private club, sometimes my menus, in a way, uh, kind of write themselves. So one of the restaurants is more of kind of classic dining. Um, there will always be a creme brulee on that menu, um, preferably a souffle. So that's two menu items taken care of right there. Um, ice cream is very popular. So, um, you know, like I said, I'm kind of spoiled in that respect. Uh, on the one hand, it takes away some of the creativity, but on the other hand, you know, it's you know, we're giving, we're giving our membership what they want. Um, but talking about fails, so in that particular restaurant that I was just speaking about, uh, a couple of years ago, we thought, oh, we'll do a rum baba. This, this will be great. We'll kind of dress it up a little bit. We baked it out, baked it in a tube. So it was like three pillars standing up on the plate, some caramel, uh, some vanilla poached pineapple, coconut cream. Thought, great dessert, tasted phenomenal. All the, the wait staff, everybody loved it. I mean, we could not give it away. And uh, so we ended up, needless to say, it had to die, had to die a natural death, and it went away. But uh, it was funny because about a year later on Instagram, the, sh the uh, hot food chef in that kitchen started just sending me like post after post <laughs> of all these rum baba pictures on Instagram, and I was like, you know what, we were just ahead of our time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, any any of the other chefs want to uh, share anything about what they feel are best practices for writing pastry menus? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, uh, where I teach at the Culinary Institute of America, I teach in the American Bounty Restaurant. Uh, it's a busy restaurant, you know, uh, obviously American. And um, I, I teach a, a segment to students about preparing, right? And you know, one of the first things that we talk about is to cook, right? Not, not necessarily for your wins, but that requires actually to get to know your guests, right? And there's a, there's a variety of ways you could possibly do that. You know, one of which that we utilize at the restaurants through comment cards, you know, of course, uh, paying attention to, uh, you know, the social media posts, you know, customers have no problem telling you, you know, what they think, right? And so when I'm thinking about them, that, that already helps a lot, you know. Um, another thing is to, I look at the menu as a, as a skeletal framework. So I want to I wanna diversify the genres and make sure that, you know, um, I have a good balance in the menu mix with that. Um, and the next thing, of course, is just cook within the rhythms of the season. And that's one of my big inspirations is I just, you know, every, every season that rolls around brings a whole fresh bounty. I look to them for inspiration. Seasonal. Thank you very much. Um, very, very appreciated. Um, if, uh, if anyone else had anything else to, um, to add, we can certainly bring that up. But I wanted to move into um, another topic, too. I know many of you are uh, accomplished writers as well. Um, and, um, you know, we do have a lot of chefs who have tuned in who uh, may be interested in, um, in doing some writing in the future. And I know that there's a lot of challenges um, associated with that. So I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit about how you came to uh, become a, a, a published author, um, and maybe even a little bit about um, the resource that you wrote. Um, so, Chef Chef, uh, Chef Licker, if you'd like to take that one first, that would be great. Uh, I decided to write a cookbook and uh, really had no idea what I was doing. I mean, zero. I think I made every single mistake you could make. Uh, I learned definitely with the first cookbook, pretty much... I was reaching out to so many other people, nobody was helping. So I'm like, okay, we're just gonna go kamikaze style and learn as we go. The first thing I definitely recommend before you even come up with a concept or anything is either hire an editor or a writer because 
we cook, you know, it's very rare to have to cook like fabulous and be a writer that can touch on having one thought in a paragraph, gram gram grammatically correct and so on. And then um, this is a little different from what I did my cookbook three years ago. There's a lot more resources that make it a lot easier. So as the other chefs will explain, for me, the most important thing is because you're conveying a message and the book will represent you. And after you're long gone, your book will still be on the shelves and around for other people to read. Is to definitely make sure your message is conveyed. So for me, I think number one is have a co-writer and an editor. And I'm sure all the other chefs will jump on between everything else. And I was sort of forced to self-publish because I was rejected by about 50, <laughs> 50 <laughs> publishing houses. And then after I, fortunately the first one worked out well, doing the second one is easier. But halfway through the second one, you're like, what the hell am I doing? So. <laughs> Perfect. I, I love it. I love it. Um, well, thank you um, for, for sharing on that. Um, and I know um, that your, your book is gorgeous. And I know you have the, this, this, uh, another, another book coming for us shortly. Um, uh, would one of the other chefs who are authors, um, I know that Chef Zabrowski, you have um, the volume two. Um, that I have not gotten my hands on yet, but I'm excited to. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the viewers as well about um, your process and a, a little bit about your project. Right, sure, yeah. Uh, volume two just got released. I'm very excited about it. Uh, whew, where to begin? I mean, you know, uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't what I expected exactly getting, getting into the process. I was a total newbie, you know, just like Jason had, had spoke about. So with that said, you know, some people think or have the attitude that you have to have it all figured out or know, know how to do it before you, you actually begin. And I would say, no, you know, just dive in, you know, it'll unfold, you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, but what I was a little bit blindsided about is, you know, like publishers, you know, they look for audiences. They don't look for authors necessarily. And so where that's going is, you need, especially in the model that, that Jason and I have undertaken, which is a little bit more of a self-publishing type model, um, you got to know how to sell this book, you know, before you even begin to write it. And, and that's something that I didn't really consider. I just thought, oh, well, I get a publisher and then I write the book and then the publisher puts it out there and it just sells, right? But no, the fact of the matter is, you know, most books don't actually make any money. Now, fortunately for me, I, I, I didn't care about making money at all. And I still don't on some level, but, but it is nice when, you know, a little bit does trickle in. Um, you know, another thing that a lot of people have begun to recognize, uh, especially in this modern age, is, is generally speaking, publishing is dead. You know, just like the old days when we would go to a record store, like, they, you know, nobody goes to a record store anymore. Everybody's streaming online. And uh, it's becoming increasingly like that nowadays as well. So, you know, just like Jason had mentioned, if, if you find yourself getting, you know, rejected time and again from a traditional publishing house, I don't view that as the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination. You know, we could, you could self-publish and do very well for yourself. But the thing is, you have to have an audience. You have to sell the book, you know, and audiences can come in a variety of ways, you know. So, for example, if you uh, have ever considered starting a blog, you probably want to do that before you begin writing the book, you know, to start getting a bedrock of people out there who are potential buyers of your book, um, you know, building and broadening your social media presence again. So you have a, a base and a bedrock of, of people who could potentially purchase the book. And, uh, you know, so that's that has been, you know, something that I've learned over the years that I, I did not uh, fully appreciate getting into the process. Uh, excellent advice. Um, and I know we have a couple of other authors, so um, I'll, I'll come to, um, to both of you as well, um, because if, uh, I, I would recommend that all pastry chefs have all of these resources um, on hand. They're just um, absolutely amazing. So um, uh, Chef Shalavana, can you um, uh, share about your uh, book as well? Oh, sorry, Jackie. I can't see it. There's something in my Oh, head. wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, I, everything that, that Jason and, and Michael said, it's the same thing, right? Like, you don't know what you're getting into, you know? I mean, I can tell you, it's, it's a lot of work, right, guys? Like, it's, it's a crazy amount of work. And I always think, like, man, I get to one step and be like, all right, I'm done. And then all of a sudden, they'd be like, okay, now we need you to do this. And I'm like, all right, photo shoot's done, pictures are selected, uh, everything's done, index is written. I'm like, oh, 
I'm done. They go, oh, you need to write the instructor manual. And I'm like, I'm going, what's an instructor manual? I don't use those. I, and then finally when that was done, I was like, oh, I'm done now. And they go, you got to do PowerPoints. Um, it, it is a big process. And I can't find a word other than awesome to describe what it's like to write a book because you take everything that you have, right? Everything that you've collected over your career and, and you take what you perceive as the best and you, and you put it into something and it's there and it's like, it, like Jason was saying, you know, it's your legacy. Like these books will be here forever. Someone's going to pull these out in 70 years and go, Oh my God, I didn't know you could make a glaze out of that. And they're like, yeah, the, those old farts were doing it a long time ago. Um, and I, I think we've all experienced that. See Natasha, right? We all grab books and go, Oh, that's been done before. There's no new ideas. It's just new ways to put it together. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed the process. Um, I have not done a second book, but I'm, I'm working on it. Um, as far as, as how I got started, I actually, I credit the Olympic team with helping me get started. I did a lot of other competition before doing the Olympic team, but we did a cold food buffet out in California and Wiley was there and they saw some of the cold food plates and they were like, who did these? And I was like, I did. And they're like, no way. And then it turned into a food styling gig for uh, professional baking. So I had a chance to work with Wayne Gislin after, after using his book for like 12 years, you know, to get to, to hang out in his kitchen and, and plate up desserts was amazing. Um, and then they just kind of kept chasing me until I did this. And I'm, I'm really glad that I committed to it. It took a long time, a lot longer than I planned for it to happen. But when it finally published, that was just an amazing <laughs> Excellent. And another uh, gorgeous book and, and, and resource for sure. Uh, Chef Coppage, uh, I'm going to uh, come to you as well. I know um, you have um, two of your books around specialized um, uh, diet um, pastry books and also um, allergies and um, love to hear your thoughts on your books. Here we go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the experience, it is an experience and um, I think like uh, some of the other panels said, you know, if you have a publisher that is willing to, uh, already has an idea of an audience. I mean, for me, you know, the whole gluten-free idea was basically self-taught. And it, for me, I was fortunate. It worked at a time in my career and my life where that was a necessity and uh, started working through it. And also, as Anthony mentioned, and Michael, you know, I had a really great uh, writer who understood how I thought and literally wrote my words uh, for me. Um, and it, it, it worked out great. It's, it is a lot of work. And like, you know, when it's, when you're long and gone, you know, the book is still around and we run out of electricity, people can still read your books. So um, I know a lot of books today are being published a lot faster because they're being uh, all digitized. But, you know, remember, you know, classic vinyl records are making a comeback. And, you know, there is that sound that a vinyl record makes that you can't get on digital, so. Agreed, uh, absolutely agree. Thank you so much. Um, well, as I mentioned, a lot of the questions that had come in in advance were from uh, culinary students. So, you know, either at the high school level uh, those who are in post secondary who, who are probably out of class right now, um, and also through some of the career changers as well. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if we might be able to um, share any advice that you have for the culinary students and baking and pastry students who, frankly, from reading the questions, are, are scared about their future and, um, and what they're doing. Uh, I'm going to start this off uh, with Chef Blunt, if you don't mind um, sharing your uh, knowledge and inspiration. I know that you have uh, an amazing program. I have visited your facilities in the past, um, and I'm wondering if you could share, and then any other um, of the pastry chefs certainly chime in. Um, I, this has definitely been an interesting, uh, you know, obviously, regarding the COVID thing. Our, our program went online for the first time ever. We did baking one basics online. And I found myself in a production kitchen shooting uh, YouTube videos. I started a YouTube state, uh, channel um, and it's baking one, it's basics. And one of the things that we knew um, kids and my students and adults and everybody else we were all going to be baking at home, no doubt. Um, and with that being said, 
um, I, I figured I'd take it as an opportunity. But I guess what I'm getting at it is you, you need to be flexible. I mean, one of the comments that one of the panelists made earlier about being flexible and turn on a dime. And I want to say I got the announcement on Saturday and by Monday morning, we had 10 videos. By Tuesday, we had 20. And by Wednesday, we had 45 videos. And then I started getting emails from high school instructors across the U.S. about using the videos because they were just professionally done style videos that didn't have ingredient amounts. It just had skill sets, basic skill sets. How do you make a biscuit with the biscuit method? How do you make a muffin using the muffin method? Um, and so on and so forth. And, and I've had a lot of high school teachers ask me about creativity. I've had them ask me about how a school handles itself and what is it going to do? And kids are scared. And I've got 32 students in my classroom. And um, I think the biggest thing is, is just make sure that you're teaching them really good, solid fundamentals. Um, Chef Coppedge earlier said, respecting the basics and understanding how to do something right. And Natasha said something about a chocolate chip cookie. Yeah, that's like, you, you got to be able to make a chocolate chip cookie um, the right way. For years, I used that as my first dodge. Whenever anybody came to work in my bakery, they had to go make chocolate chip cookies. And you'd be surprised how many of those people could not make a chocolate chip cookie properly. And they just spent forty or $50,000 on an education at a local college where we were. And I thought to myself, they've missed the point fluff and everything is great um and i think um, kids nowadays that are coming through whether it's high school or first starting in culinary school we just need to make sure that we're grounding them the right way i'm not trying to say you know stifle them and they're not allowed to be creative that'll come creativity will come but if you can't make a basic creamy method cookie or a basic chiffon or something like that everything else is for nothing it's just lipstick on the pig so um you know i think um basics 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 to our our hospitality educators out there in the uh, high school and and in the colleges just make sure you're really teaching them a really good understanding of basics first and that's that's where you need to focus excellent thank you very much um might any panelists sure sorry jackie can i speak to it from sort of an employer standpoint Yes. So definitely, um, you know, it'll, there's so many unknowns right now because we don't know how quickly, uh, you know, the, our, for us, you know, we have, we have kind of a set customer base, but a large portion of our business is banquets. So until those really kind of pick up to pre COVID uh, times, yeah, we're not going to need as much labor as we, as we have in the past. But I think that this is the perfect time for students to really um, buckle down and, focus on you know getting that skill set really nailing it because it is it's going to be a competitive market and it's going to be a competitive market for quite a long time um if they're not on their game you know it, there's a lot of people looking for work it's much easier you know you, you obviously you don't want to waste the time and train somebody and have them you know not succeed but if they're not making it you know that there are other people out there that will Great, great point. Um, any of the other uh, chefs or, or culinary educators have any advice um, for the culinary students? Yeah, J um, Jackie, you know, I heard that you, you had used the word that some of the some of the potential culinary school students are quote scared, right? And um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I can understand that, you know, we're, we're in this new uh, pandemic sort of environment. And you know, it's, it's uh, nearly decimated our business. And job prospects seem, you know, like uncertain and, you know, everyone, everyone should feel, you know, a certain measure of, uh, you know, uncertainty with all that. Uh, but just getting back to my experience at the Culinary Institute of America, you know, I deal with students every single day. You know, when I'm in American Bounty, the students are my cooks and, and that's how it goes. And so I get to deal and, and get to know them uh, very, very closely. And, you know, the one thing that I can share, at least at the CIA in particular, you know, being as we're a college, you know, we offer two and four year degree programs, you know, as everyone knows, the business is, is, uh, has diversified a lot, you know, since, since I started, you know, getting uh, into, into cooking and baking. And there's a lot more opportunities than there used to be. 
So I, I would say that first off, um, you know, and secondly, it's interesting that I, I run into a, a good number of students who they get into the baking and pastry program at the school, they go through it, they love it. And then the, all of a sudden they start, you know, maybe working in one of the outlets uh, on campus. And then they realize, wow, I really like being in front of the house. You know, I love talking to the guests. I'm a people person. Geez, I didn't realize this. And all of a sudden their, their, their mind shifts towards uh, working professionally in the front of the house when they went to school for baking and pastry. So that's another opportunity. I have other students who, you know, we have a culinary science program. It's really interesting. And uh, they get a taste of that and they, they start getting into it. And now all of a sudden they're going off into this whole other culinary science direction. So, you know, my larger point is there's a lot more opportunities in the business than just traditional, say, baking or cooking in a restaurant, you know? So there's that. The other thing that I would, that I would say is, um, you know, you gotta, you know, some of the other panelists had touched on it earlier. You, you gotta have some level of passion for, for what we're doing here because there's easier ways to make money, right? Quite frankly. And um, if, if you have that passion for, you know, whether it be baking, or cooking and hospitality and, and pleasing, pleasing people, then uh, that's good. But if you are not sure that you have that passion, you know, then you might want to rethink, you know, what we're doing because without that passion, like others had said earlier, um, you know, it, it might, it might not be the, the, the role for you because at least for me and a lot of others, you know, this is not just some job. This is like my life. It's, it's my profession. It's what I, it's what I do. And, um, you know, so if it, there's a, there's a saying that like, you know, you don't choose the profession, the profession chooses you. So if you feel that way, you're probably in the right direction. But if you do not feel that way, then maybe we need to rethink. Great, excellent. Um, well, thank you so much. And of course, if anyone else wants to chime in, um, feel free. Jackie, um, can I talk to that real quick? I'm sorry, my microphone was off. Yeah, Chef. Um, you know, the, there are, there, right, things are going to change now. But the one thing that people have to remember is people are always going to need to eat. Um, I know that sounds kind of kind of corny, and uh, it, it's true though, right? And in Illinois here, we're getting ready to to open up the outdoor dining, and everything's booked the first weekend already through the fourth. They open up on the 29th. Um, is everyone going to go out and eat? No. Are there things to do? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we've all we've all could tell a story about how we we faced adversity in our lives, and there's there's a lot of different ways to make money through food. Um, th there are going to be jobs. And, you know, it's not just saying that to people that there's going to be jobs. There are going to be jobs. People are going to eat. People are going to need to work. I've heard people say they can't get hired. Nobody's hiring. Um, my son just got hired at a restaurant a couple of weeks ago. It's fast food, but you know what? He's, he's working. He's got a job. He's 16. They hired him. They could have hired somebody older that has more experience, maybe has a better track record than a 16-year-old kid. But, but guys, there's, there's jobs out there. Don't be afraid. Go out there, work, bust your butt, and you're going to be the one to keep the job. Fabulous. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll get um, to one um, uh, that a question that had come in in advance. Um, I think this is kind of a fun one. Um, any and all of you can certainly answer this, but they were wondering um, as a pastry chef what your um, favorite piece of kitchen equipment or favorite tool was or if you have a dream kitchen piece of equipment or tool. Um, so uh, Chef Blunt, I saw you shaking your head up and down. Um, and so if you'd like to kick us off and then any of the other chefs who'd like to chime in, uh, please feel free. I, I answered this earlier to someone, the private thing. I'm a, I'm a sucker for a really good spoon for quenelling. Um, and, and I have a collection of them at work, but really the one thing that I think I couldn't do without is my offset spatula. Like I, I, <laughs> I've decorated a cake without one and used a butter knife before. That was not fun. Um, I, I can I can pick up fish. I can pick up a burger. I I mean, it seems like I can do almost anything I need to do ever with a good quality offset spatula. So that's that's mine. I know I just took the good one off the table though. So <laughs> give me a bowl scraper any day. <clears throat> you gotta you gotta you gotta get down to the bottom of that bowl. <laughs> My staff, my staff has gotten to a point where they just joke about it now. They're like, we know chef, scrape the bowl. So um, as far as a dream piece of equipment, if anybody is looking for a home for a blast freezer, I got one. I'll take really good care of it, I promise. 
Per perfect. Um, I love it. Chef Fogg, how about you? Um, well, my dream thing would be a dough sheeter. I know that in larger operations, um, a lot of them have them. I've worked for hotels that have had them before, and I don't have much of a use for one or any space for it at the restaurant, but I know that I'd be able to do a lot more high volume things like lamination and, you know, rolling tarto and all of that uh, for the volume that we do at the restaurant, or at least we can do. And uh, so there's a lot of things that I don't do at the restaurant because it, I'm limited to having to roll all these things by hand. It can be done, but uh, there are so many other things to do as well that it's easier to focus on those other things. Great. Um, and Chef Coppage, um, any favorite tools or equipment? Uh, the plastic bowl scraper. You got to stop, drop, and scrape. Get down to the bottom. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, and Chef uh, Licker. Uh, for me, because what I do is I travel quite a lot and um, I bring my own silicone molds everywhere. I need a cold freezer or a blast freezer or I'm in serious trouble. Because usually they put me in a corner, which is like one meter that's hot. <laughs> then I'm like, okay, I don't care. As long as I have a blast freezer or a strong freezer, which freezes like whatever I'm making overnight, then I'm set. Um, everything else I can pretty much do by my hands which I've always had to actually, because there's no choice. Excellent, okay. Uh, I am seeing a theme through here as well. Um, and uh, Chef Shalvana. Well, you know, you know, like when you, you kind of go, well, I've, I've, I've arrived, I've, I've done my thing. Um, Jeff knows and Jeremy's gonna be a little bit jealous over Christmas. I um, recently acquired a small dough shooter for my house. <laughs> because um, I'm not one of these rich instructors, guys. I'm broke. I got four kids. Um, <laughs> I, I, I sell product out of my house. We're allowed to produce a little bit here in Illinois, and that's what I do. And um, I invested all my money from last year to buy a dough sheeter, so it's kind of cool. So when I say my sheeter, most people are like, oh, it work? And I'm like, no, it's in my workshop. Um, I, I think the next thing would be a nice big mixer, but... Uh, the small hand tools are, are always important too. And, you know, for, for the people out there that are, are wondering, you know, just real quick, Jackie, back onto the worry thing and not too much worry here. You know, it, when all this started, everybody's saying, you know, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of restaurants are going to go out of business. A lot of restaurants are going to go out of business. And, and that's, that's terribly unfortunate. We've been supporting the ones in town here that we can support. And, and some of the ones that might go out of business may have, may have been on hard times for a while or looking to get out. And, and when they go, it's going to give other people an opportunity to come back in. Those spots aren't going to sit empty for long. I think new businesses are going to come in and uh, Phoenix will rise from the ashes and we'll, we'll have new businesses coming in and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a new industry on the other side of this. Great, uh, very appreciated. Um, and you know, we have so, so many questions um, that have come in in advance and the ones that we see coming in through the, the q and A. I I think this speaks to one thing and that's that this conversation about pastry and pastry chefs has to continue. Um, and uh, I'll certainly make uh, all efforts um, to make sure that um, this gets the attention that it needs and that we can um, continue to learn and share from each other um, and these best practices. I'd love to go around um, as well, and um, you can just share any final thoughts. Um, I can't believe it's coming up to the end as well, but um, it can be on any, anything that you would like to share with the culinary uh, and pastry professionals and students who are tuning in. Um, and um, I will uh, come first to, um, let's see, we'll go Chef Capper first. Um. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to go with the theme, hone your craft, hone your craft, be passionate, love what you do. Um, if you, if you love what you do, you're never going to work a day in your life. Not entirely true, but it definitely goes a long way to, to making what we do, um, you know, a, a great choice. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Chef Fogg, if you wouldn't mind sharing your final thoughts. Um, well, going back to, you know, right now, the whole, these are uncertain times, like I never imagined that I would be out of work for two months with no idea of when I would be going back. And so what we've said before about having to be flexible and to pivot and be creative, you know, I took it upon myself, I just started selling baked goods out of my house, just, you know, through my blog site and whatnot. And it turned out to be a much like bigger success than I expected. And I was working pretty much the same number of hours as I was when I was in the restaurant. 
Um, so it's at this point, like do what you can that's within your power to stay, you know, active, whether it's you just learning new things at home or honing your craft, like we've said, or, you know, find another way maybe to make a little bit of money or, or something, but you know, you have to be willing to make those changes and, you know, take it upon yourself to stay, stay active is, is my thing. Wonderful. Uh, very appreciated. Um, and uh, Chef Blunt. Um, one of the biggest things that I did, you know, I mean, it's March 13th when I stepped foot out of my kitchen to work and really have it back out of it and grab a few ingredients here and there for my students. Um, find the one thing you're not really great at or something that just you need to work on and you got a lot of free time on your hands, work on it. There's no excuses. Um, I thought I knew sourdough bread really well. And then I started digging in and doing it more and doing it more and doing it more. And I think um, you have time. You have time on your hands right now to go in and dig in on some stuff that you, you know, sometimes we all have that project and you push it to the side cause you get busy. Now there's no excuse. Get busy on it, dig in, and experiment and have fun. Learn from it and share. Very important, share it. That's a, an excellent point. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're going to come to uh, Chef Liquor next. If, if anyone's been wondering what the birds and the, and the glorious breeze and everything else in, and the, and the, and the can, uh, Chef is calling in today from Hawaii. So, uh, Chef, your final thoughts? Um, I think my perspective is a little different than everyone else's because um, I, I lived in Asia for 12, 13 years, and I did live through the bird flu and the tail end of SARS. And we will get through this. There are ways to make money. You see a tremendous amount of people becoming more entrepreneurial, making things out of their house and selling it. I mean, even I'm doing that a little bit. I'm like, whoa, 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 okay. Like, let me try to take advantage of Ashley not being a crazy maniac and have some downtime because everyone I know, everybody's worried about money and everybody's worried about their career. But in the realm of your whole life, this time is actually quite minute. So how about chill a little bit and um, don't be so hard on yourself and drive yourself insane because the only really person you're affecting is yourself. So um, I've seen some of the worst things and I'm in Hawaii, so it can't be that bad overall. <laughs> Well, oh, also, one more, Jackie, one more thing is I want when people I want to see, because I know this is going to be a fragile time, especially with the media making it with mental health. This is the time to really focus on yourself as well and empower yourself and believe in yourself. You know, I understand that everybody's fragile and things happen, but working on yourself should be the number one most important thing because you're stuck with yourself forever. So work on that and then your career. And there's always a way to make things happen. So just do it and focus and execute. That's wonderful advice. Certainly um, the mental wellness um, of the chefs has been uh, top of mind for all of us here uh, in UCF as well. Um, and uh, Chef Coppage, your final uh, thoughts and final words for the viewers. Well, try to remember, even though we have all of the technology at our fingertips, everybody over 100 years ago made it through the Spanish flu. And it was probably food service employees who really kept everybody afloat by keeping their stomachs full. So we'll get through. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much. And Chef Shalbana. Uh, you know, to kind of piggyback off of what Jason was saying. Yeah. You know, that's what I was telling my students and, and a lot of my friends, like, I know it sucks. Our, our pay has been reduced or eliminated and all that, but you know, if you're going to work in this industry, man, you'll never get a break like this ever again. Right. Um, and then, and then I think for me, the biggest thing is, is still not going along with Jason said, you know, think about that, but like, if you're at home and you're not at school or you're not at work, there's still ways for you to, to improve during this time. Right. You could, even when you're working in your kitchen at home, try to be as clean as possible. Try to be as efficient as possible without driving yourself crazy. Think about, think about some of the things that you've wanted to do that you haven't been able to do because of the time that you spend at work, you know, um, and, and just challenge yourself, whether it's it's through those little daily tasks to be the best at what you can do. That's that's what I used to do before I started competing. And then, you know, an opportunity comes up to compete to make yourself better. Um, 
just just strive on perfecting what you do. We'll never make it perfect, right? But our goal is always to get as close to perfect as possible. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I certainly appreciate it. I know uh, I'm certainly um, inspired. I can't wait to continue this conversation. Um, I didn't even get to get into a lot of the competition uh, questions uh, that uh, I had hoped um, that we could. But again, uh, we will continue this uh, conversation uh, very soon. Um, and also just uh, chatting with you all today, I can feel the passion that you all have. And I know um, that the future will be sweet for the baking and pastry industry um, after uh, we get through the current challenges. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the discussion um, and uh, we applaud all of your flexibility and how much you truly care about the success of your bake shops and also the safety and satisfaction of your guests and also of your students as well. Uh, we will be sending out the information as well um, about the um, uh, different publications and links um, to the different schools and things with the follow-up to this email. We will also um, post this recording on the ACF Online Learning Center as well. Um, and for um, those of you who are uh, tuning in, we will have a webinar next Wednesday as well. Um, I hope that you'll join us. This will be on food media skills. So we will deal with social media and food photography, how to do the very best demos uh, on TV uh, and touch a little bit more about some of the um, food writing opportunities as well. Um, and uh, again, uh, to all of you viewing, all of the chefs and culinary students, the ACF applauds you. Uh, please keep up the great work and please reach out if we can support you. Uh, also go over to wearechefs.com to register um, for any upcoming webinars and also um, to check out uh, the opportunities for online learning. Uh, we still have the free bundle available um, until the end of June. So on behalf of the ACF and ACF National Office, please be safe um, and we will look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much uh, and have a great day. Thank you panelists. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. See you soon. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody.